Welcome back to Through the Lectionary. This week we'll be looking at the text, the gospel text, written for the second Sunday after the Epiphany. And that text is written in John's Gospel, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. So the first of the signs that John gives us in his gospel, of course we uh, historically have this text as in the Epiphany season about Jesus manifesting uh, his glory. But what we have going on here, contextually again, is uh, John completing this uh, recreation of the world through the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So completing that, uh, that six to seven day cycle with on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard uh, over and over and over what a, a big deal uh, wedding feasts were in uh, not only in this part of the world then, but also continuing even to this day. So it is the event of the year. Everything needed to be in order. And if the bridegroom was not able to provide for the guests at the wedding feast, this would reflect very poorly upon him as he began his his marriage and uh, it would bring shame upon him. And honor and shame is a very a, a very big deal in this part of the world even still today. So the wine runs out. This is not a good thing. Okay, the wine is is running out. He's going to be shamed if anybody knows, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes to Jesus and says, look, they have no wine. Well, what's Jesus going to do? He's a guest at the wedding feast. So Jesus says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And this is a theme that we kind of hear through John's gospel about Jesus saying, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Over and over and over and over we hear this until he gets to Thursday. When he gets to Thursday, Maundy Thursday, then finally uh, his hour has come and it's time to go to the cross. So Jesus says, look, uh, what what does this have to do with me? Now, this can come off as kind of harsh, right? Jesus saying uh, woman, uh, referring to his mother as woman instead of mother or dearest mother or something like this. Uh, Because I think when it hits our ears, our American ears, we... We want to hear it very kind of derogatory, like woman, but uh, that's not what is coming off. Now, there is there is some rebuke here. We don't need to disregard that, but we see elsewhere in the gospel that this is not the only time Jesus uses this word. Also, when he's referring to men, he'll say man. It's simply a, a, a way to refer to people, so we don't need to go down this uh, derogatory kind of uh, trail here. We, we do need to recognize the rebuke, but it's not such a you know kind of 20th, 21st century American dude sitting in his recliner shouting at his wife kind of thing either. So he says, my hour has not yet come. Uh, but Mary, right, in faith, says to the servants, right, she knows he's going to do something. So do whatever he, do whatever he tells you. Now, the other, the other thing about this, and 
and I know some of you have come to this channel because of because of uh, the chosen reviews, and this is one of the scenes in the chosen that I, I really don't like because all of the emphasis in the scene there is placed upon the one who brings the wine instead of falling on the bridegroom. It has nothing to do with where they bought the wine. It has everything to do with the bridegroom and his ability to to care for uh, to care for the wedding party. And that needs to be made very, very clear. Uh, and, and again, not to get off on a on a chosen thing here, but that's part of the, the series where our our minds biblically can be warped because we've seen something, seen things done a certain way on film when it's not necessarily the way things are are done, you know, scripturally. So the bridegroom is, is the one responsible. So the text tells us there were six stone water jar, jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding uh, 20 or uh, 30 gallons. And that, you know, that's obviously corrected for our English ears. That's not what the original says, but that's the, that's the equivalent in English, 20 or 30 gallons. So Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. So just like last week with Jesus uh, being baptized, right? Jesus is, is always kind of around water, especially in John's gospel, isn't he? Notice where he is. Um, in the beginning, we see him being baptized. Now here at the wedding in Cana, being baptized. Uh, Jesus talking about being born in chapter 3. Chapter 4, the Samaritan woman at the well with water. Uh, let me let me think. Going into chapter 7, the last day of the Feast of Booths, Jesus pours out water and says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. So going all the way down, all the way until the end where Jesus' side is pierced and, and outflows outflows water. So there's really something to be said in John's gospel for Jesus and his proximity to water. Seems like it's, uh, seems like it's kind of important for something, isn't it? So fill them up with water, and he fi they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So there's no waving of the hands. There's no closing your eyes and thinking really hard. It's just fill it up with water, draw some out. That simple. Okay, that simple. Jesus' signs in his gospel are very, very simple. Almost seemingly, um, they're not extraordinary. They're extraordinary to us, but they're not extraordinary to him. It's very simple. It's his word with something. So right now it's his word with with water. Draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who drew the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you've kept the good wine until now. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, the same way if you were going to have a a party, right? You, you take out the good uh, vintage bottle first. You might pour it into a carafe, but you you know you want to leave the bottle out there so the people know what it is. It's it's uh, what they do in restaurants too, and and you you drink that and you and you drink it slowly and you drink it deeply, and it and it gladdens your heart. And then once your heart is gladdened, um, you're not gonna spend all that money on the really, really fine bottle again, you know, bring out something a little lesser and then bring out something a little lesser and a little lesser. And um, nobody at that point knows and they're a little more heavy handed with their drinking. Uh, so you don't want just people swilling back the good stuff, the stuff that you've kept for a long time. But that's not what happens here. Jesus instead uh, turns water into the most magnificent, a foretaste of the feast that is to come, right? From Isaiah chapter 25, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make a feast of rich food, of food full of marrow and of wine, of aged wine that is well refined. So they're, they're getting a taste, a foretaste of what God is capable of, of the wine that will flow from the hills when all things are new. So they've got these six stone water jars, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. They've produced, you know, in between, by our standards, probably 500 to 750 bottles of wine. Um, again, I've heard some kind of 
misinterpretations here that on, on the one hand, on the one hand, I've heard that Jesus is promoting drunkenness. He's not promoting drunkenness. On the other hand, I've heard that uh, that Jesus is uh, wasteful. That there's no way that there would have been that many people in Cana. Cana was a small town for that much wine after they've already started the feast. Well, you can't make that argument. You don't know how many people were there. Um, further, Jesus is not promoting waste. Think of the 23rd Psalm, which most of you probably all know by heart, about uh, God preparing a table for them in the midst of their enemies. Uh, you anoint my head with oil, right? He doesn't anoint heads with oil just just enough, right? He says, the cup runneth over. He gives more than anybody could ever need, and that's what he's doing here, here also. So the... The sign has happened, and uh, the text just ends. This is the this the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his di- disciples uh, believed in him. So we don't get the end of the story here. We don't get anybody's reactions. The text just goes, right? He's going back to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stay there for a few days. That's it. And then he encounters Nicodemus. So the the theatrical reactions that we want, uh, does the bridegroom ever find out that it's Jesus? We don't know. Uh, Not the point of the text. The point of the text is Jesus manifesting the glory of God and the disciples believing in him. Okay, so that's what we see. Jesus beginning his his ministry here and uh, and his signs. So the wedding feast at Cana, very popular text, very well-known text. Jesus manifesting his his glory for us as we begin this uh, season after Epiphany together. So I hope that you all have a great weekend. Uh, Go uh, attend the divine service, receive the sacrament of the altar, grow in, uh, in love toward God and in love toward one another. Until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks for taking a trip through the lectionary with me. Like the video. Comment down below with questions and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.